Well, welcome to our second service here as Trinity Church. And uh, if you're new, you've joined us at a very exciting time as uh, we're starting our series in the book of Colossians uh, today. Where we're a new church plant, you probably have seen that as uh, coffee just didn't happen this morning. And uh, that's just uh, the way it is. Uh, Church planning right there for you. Uh, So we're starting the book of Colossians today. We're going to be doing this for a couple months, take a break for our Advent series, and then uh, pick it up again, beginning of 2018. And uh, if you didn't get one already, uh, we've got listening guides in the back. This will aid your listening. You can lift your hand or just go back and, and grab one here. And so why are we studying through a whole book of the Bible. Is it because DJ, Tom, and I have nothing to talk about that we couldn't tell you, you know, give our thoughts on work ethic, family, give you kind of a a spiritual pep rally for the week? Well, I mean, we could do that. That would be of very little value to you. Honestly, it'd be better if and at least more entertaining if DJ talks about Carolina sports. Tom tells some uh, funny stories about uh, what people try to make insurance claims for. And you probably realize I could ramble on about bacon and monster and ridiculous things like that. But no, we want, we want to speak God's word to us and let it edify us as a church to quick reasons why we're doing the a whole book of the Bible is that number one is it forces us to deal with what the Bible deals with. We're just going straight through. If you see us skipping a paragraph, like call, call us out on that, that, Hey, we want whatever's in, in the whole council of God is what we're called to preach and teach. And we want to do that. We don't want to preach and teach our pet issues. We want to preach and teach what uh, God has called uh, the church to hear. And also we want to demonstrate how to study the Bible on your own. So by going through a book of the Bible like this, we want to prepare you. You want to go home every day, you, you know, whatever your r- routine is, is We want you to be studying God's word. We want to prepare you, not that, ooh, you went to seminary and learned a few Greek words and, you know, well, then you can study the Bible and figure out what these things mean and, you know, find which verse applies to this and what other verses are connected. We want to um, enable, encourage you as you uh, study the Bible on your own. So with that, Let's read the first uh, 14 verses of Colossians. Now, we're only going to focus on the first two uh, verses today after we do some uh, introductory material. Uh, But uh, just to kind of give us a flavor of uh, this book, we're going to be studying for a few months. Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as in Indeed, in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with 
the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father God, I would pray that you would teach us from your word. We, we don't want to hear my words, my thoughts, ideas. We want to hear what, what you have to say uh, from your word. In Christ's name. And that he would receive the glory. Amen. So, uh, since we're starting off this series on Colossians, first things first, we got to talk about the background. And also important when you are studying a book of the Bible on your own, that to like get a little background, well, where are you in the Bible? What is this about? It'll make a lot more sense before you get the mug with the little verse, you know, my, my favorite verse, before you get it, it uh, tattooed on your body, before you, you know, find a character in the Bible, you're going to name a kid after, you, you probably should, you know, get a little context of where was this written, oh, who was it written to, it wasn't just delivered in a little pithy statement that just fell down from heaven, uh, it came in context of a, a book of a Bible written to certain people, written by uh, an author, and is valuable to know that. If you uh, have like a study Bible, some even just uh, standard Bibles, just give a little, little blurb at the beginning, can be quite helpful as you study the Bible on your own. So uh, with that, uh, first thing, we have to know who, who wrote this. And even before that, where in the world is this? So you might, if you have a physical copy of the Bible, see that, well, it's toward the end. And I mean, if you just have your app out, you might have just typed COL and it just came up like, whoa, there we go, I guess. But it, in, the, in God's story, so you have the Old Testament as it prepares and leads up to Christ, uh, have the Gospels that presents the life of Christ, his perfect life, death on our behalf, his uh, resurrection. This is 30 years after the death of Christ that uh, Jesus sent out his followers to plant churches. And that's exactly uh, what they're doing. This um, is to one of those uh, churches. So authorship, this is if, you know, First verse, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul and Timothy. Paul, uh, as you might know, was a Christian killer turned Christian maker. That uh, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Um, he was trying to snuff out the gospel, trying to persecute Christians. Uh, Jesus made him do a full 180. And uh, he was never the same. He called him, changed his name, Saul to Paul, as he was uh, called to, uh, as a Jew, called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, as f- before he started doing his, say, public ministry and his uh, missionary journeys, as uh, we call them, he uh, spent a few years uh, learning from Jesus and uh, serving in a church. And also mentions Timothy. So everyone thinks of Paul as the author, and, and Paul is the, the main author. Timothy gets a, a mention in here. Prob- probably, or you could say, may, or at least maybe is the uh, Emanuensis, the guy who's doing the writing as Paul tells him what to write. But he doesn't receive a mention here just because he has good handwriting. 
are like, whoa, well, he, he did the physical writing. That that's not what's going on there. It's that he's one of uh, Paul's closest companions, uh, partners in the gospel. Paul even calls him uh, my own son in the faith. He was a, a firm believer just like his, his mother and his uh, grandmother. And not to be lost in our discussion of who wrote this book is we've got to include the Holy Spirit, that this is uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he guided them to write complete truth. Just a couple verses to make this clear. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So breathed out by God, how? 2 Peter 1, 21, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it, it says prophecy there. Well, is that just the Old Testament? A little later in 2 Peter uh, three sixteen says, there are, uh, referring to the writings of Paul here, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. We'll, we'll, we'll see some of those. Which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. That Paul's writings and the other writings we have in the New Testament were on par with Old Testament scripture, prophecy the writings of uh, Moses. So what type of book is this? You, you, you may already know this. This is an uh, epistle, a letter. Uh, the main audience is this church at Colossae. But uh, in these days, it was meant to be circulated. It wasn't just like Paul was writing it to them. Uh, he also is going to mention that um, Laodicea in uh, chapter 4, presumably also Hierapolis, and churches would pass these letters around. They didn't have the internet. They just put it on, online, put it on an app or anything like that. They couldn't mass produce uh, books. As Gutenberg hadn't come along just yet, had many centuries to come. And uh, they would uh, share these uh, different writings, uh, inspired writings uh, amongst themselves. And uh, just another thing to note here is that there's no copyright law. So you're probably going to see that, hmm, th this sounds a little bit like Ephesians here. There's, oh, uh, well, that, that's the same kind of information and uh, some similarities. And that's good and fine. Paul, it's not like he's limited. Well, I said that in one book. I mean, I can't say that in another book. Actually, this is a uh, very valuable uh, teaching instruction for the church. And he's going to uh, say that to multiple different churches as they need to hear and, uh, and rehear these words as they uh, share these uh, letters uh, amongst the, the churches. So, right, so who's the audience? Probably figured this out. Uh, the church at Colossae. Um, so where is this? We're going to pull up a map here. It's just good to at least see, even though, I mean, this doesn't, I may mean, not like, oh yeah, I was driving there last week. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but just to understand that, I mean, this is a, a real place that's um, situated in Asia Minor there on, uh, with, with neighbors of Laodicea, Hierapolis. It's... Um, in the Lycus Valley, Valley, a south bank of the Lycus there. Um, at this time, it, it was a fairly prosperous region. Now, technically, uh, Colossae has never been excavated, so some of the information we know about it is from uh, the other cities around, and we can kind of presume that uh, some similarities and the like. Um, we also get some information from uh, Revelation, and John's, oh, well, Jesus' address to the seven churches there. Remember uh, the little part about Laodicea uh, being uh, lukewarm? Well, 
uh, we know that uh, Hierapolis was blessed with uh, medicinal hot springs. A Colossae, what we're going to be talking about, uh, was uh, blessed with uh, refreshingly cold water. But uh, Laodicea, uh, they kind of got the, the short stick here that you had to go uh, five miles to, to get water. This isn't just driving to Walmart. This takes a while, and by the time you get your water and get back, it would be uh, lukewarm water. Uh, what, what about the social context uh, of this letter? Well, this is a first century Roman Empire. Uh, one of the genius things about uh, the Roman Empire, I mean, it lasted for centuries, was that they allowed uh, different areas to uh, retain autonomous uh, civic uh, control and leadership as long as they weren't you know, causing a, a big uproar. And uh, that's the case with uh, Colossae here. One other thing about uh, being in the Roman Empire is that uh, they were blessed with the Roman road building campaign, which allowed both for you know, spreading the gospel, sharing these uh, epistles for travel for Paul as he's uh, making his way around uh, Asia Minor and the like. Uh, Ethnicity-wise, so Colossae is a Gentile city, but th there's good evidence that the, there's a, a at least somewhat significant Jewish minority in the city. Likely multiple synagogues that think more like house synagogues, not huge um, synagogues you'd go to. The church likely reflected this Gentile Jew uh, mixture. And uh, when did this church start? Uh, it likely started uh, when Paul was in Ephesus. So uh, turn with me to Acts 19. Uh, Paul spent three years in Ephesus and enjoyed a very successful time of ministry there. Uh, this is kind of weird for Paul, as he likes to travel around, uh, plant one church, go to another one, make a, another visit. To spend three years is a little atypical for uh, the Apostle Paul. But look in verses 8 through 10, what Luke records here. And he entered the synagogue, it is Paul, and, and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the wor word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. See that there, it says all the residents of Asia, but you know, Paul is stationed here in Ephesus. It's, it seems that he's not traveling around and himself preaching to um, these different cities, but instead uh, here had guys coming to him, hearing about coming to um, becoming Christians. Uh, one of them we, we see mentioned in uh, our book, Colossians, is uh, Paphras. Uh, he probably traveled to Ephesus, heard Paul's teaching, was discipled by Paul, was taught by Paul, and then returned back and uh, planted this church, probably also planted uh, churches around uh, this uh, region. You know, Paul had never actually been to this church that he's addressing, but he uh, certainly um, dearly loved this church. Uh, Paul's setting, as he writes, he writes this epistle, is that he's uh, imprisoned. He alludes to it later in the, uh, the epistle. Uh, probably in Rome, which would put it about AD uh, 62, so 10 years or so after he had, uh, was doing his ministry in Ephesus, 
uh, it's probably around the same time that he wrote Ephesians and, and uh, Philemon. So why did he write to this group of Christians, this church, uh, that he had never met? He had met the uh, presumable uh, founder of the church and uh, knew some uh, significant members of the church. Well, why is he writing to them? Well, well, first of all, it's to encourage them, as we see in this book, to press on to maturity. And uh, also to combat uh, false teaching that was uh, creeping uh, into uh, the church. The exact nature of this, theologians go off the rails on this. Uh, I read one commentary that uh, said in the 19th century, he counted up, I guess he had too much spare time on his hands, but counted up 40 some different theories about what this heresy, false teaching, in Colossae was. And part of the problem is we don't, we're here on one side of the conversation and to be able to completely, you know, well, what were they saying that Paul responds in this way um, is an inexact science to say the least. Um, A couple things we can say about it is that it, it does seem to be have an a Jewish element to it. So as, as we go through this, uh, this book, we're going to see uh, Paul talk about circumcision, angels, human tradition, Sabbath, festivals, new moons. Some of these, if not all, seem to more relate to a, a Jewish perspective. Gentiles aren't too interested in Sabbath. Um, circumcision isn't high on their radar. Uh, but at the same time, there seems to be an element of syncretism uh, to this heresy, to this false teaching. And one of the important elements of the Roman Empire that we just talked about was that these roads that uh, Rome built allowed the travel of ideas like the gospel, but also allowed the travel of other ideas, uh, false teaching too. And it seems to be a collision here in a Colossae of different religious beliefs. And, and th- that's what we can say about uh, this heresy going on in Colossae. It doesn't seem like Paul thinks the church is about ready to blow up, but that this is creeping into the church. And uh, Paul understands that the way heresy works best, quotation marks, is most destructive harmful to the church is if it comes from within. So for you know, for us, if you go by CVS and there's a guy out there, maybe with a sign, maybe with a bullhorn too, saying the resurrection is a hoax, that uh, Jesus' disciples were on weed when they you know, wrote, the, wrote the New Testament. Well, well, would you say, hmm, that's, that sounds good. I should hear more. You know, like, hmm, he looks kind of homeless, but I, I should look up his website and read. You, you just drive by. I'm like, oh, this guy's got problems. I don't know what, what his deal is. But if you're a community group leader who believes most of the same things you believe and you've learned from him, you, you know that person and says, hey, I, I, I affirm everything else, but that this one thing, that that's far more destructive, far more enticing to the church of someone inside or somebody who's closely related, has friends, can um, affirm many of the same things that uh, the members of the church were affirming and uh, more um, certainly more convincing to members of the church. And Paul understands that. And that's why he's going to address this as he does not want that heresy uh, blowing up the church as it creeps in. Um, So you, you may be tempted to dismiss this epistle or at least question its relevance 
to us, you know, it's been almost 2,000 years uh, since Paul wrote this, since the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. But we need to see us in this epistle as we're going to be studying it for the next uh, few months that, um, that not only is this inspired in this God's word, but see how similar our situation is to theirs, that they were a church plant maybe maybe eight years old, or were eight days old, um, but, but not that far removed. Uh, Paul hasn't visited this church. And you know what? Paul hasn't physically come in those doors. If he did, I, I would be happy to let him uh, get up here and uh, preach. And uh, we'll, we'll wait till uh, next week on uh, this, uh, this sermon. And... Um, plethora of competing philosophies, ideologies around and danger of mixing that with Christianity. That's their situation. And you know what? That doesn't sound a whole lot different than our day and what's out there today. Uh, Two basic postures as we start this study, you can take to honestly all of God's word, but particularly uh, as we're studying uh, Colossians, there's uh, two basic ones. You can either uh, stand on God's word and say, don't want to kill my Bible here. Um, you can say, I'm going to read, God, read this book. And you might not say it out loud, but I'm going to interpret it the way I want to. And, you know, guess what? how you usually end up at conclusions is that, hmm, it sounds a lot like what I'm already doing and just kind of encouraging me to do a little bit more of what I'm already doing. It's not really convicting. It's, it, it's my spiritual, as I would say, Red Bull. You could say coffee if you're, you're dying for some coffee right now uh, for the week. But what we want to do here is, you know, we want to let God's word stand over us and submit to, come with the attitude of humility of if God teaches me in God's word, whether it's in my private study or as we study uh, Colossians here, I want to submit and obey what God says. Whether I like it, whether it tells me I need to change, which no one likes to change and Uh, That's the way we are as humans, but we want to submit to and come to uh, this book and learn from God's Holy Spirit as he uh, teaches us. Just a couple things to get the most value out of this study and with this posture of humility as I come letting the Word of God stand over me. I'm not trying to read into the text, what I want to hear, but I want to hear from God and what he has to say to us uh, to get the most benefit from this study is to read this letter in your own time throughout the week. Don't just, don't just come and like, okay, we're reading two verses today. Next week we're going to read five, six or something like that. Read it through, read, read the whole letter. It was written as a letter and Read the whole letter, read the whole first chapter, start meditating, thinking about, chewing on, you know, what what does this mean? How does this apply? You know, write down uh, questions you might have. Pray over it uh, in preparation for your own heart as you come to uh, this building to worship with us on a Sunday. Uh, Pray over it. And then as you hear from DJ Tom, myself, Seth, uh, whoever, you know, if the Apostle Paul walks in, he's not um, preaching, um, t- take notes. You grab your listening guide, uh, take notes, and then, you know, write down questions, objections you might have, and, and then obviously join a community group and uh, come to community group. Community group isn't meant to be a time that your leader preaches the sermon, you know, does the sermon 2.0, uh, to your leader's going to do some teaching, but we want our community groups to be a time of interaction, a time of a dialogue. You can bring up your your questions. You can 
uh, bring up thoughts you had about the sermon. And we want it to be a time of uh, application of God's word, because of what value is this if we read it and hear the sermon and we just go out and it doesn't make a difference tomorrow morning when you're at work or taking care of kids or, or doing whatever God's called you to do. And then repeat, as this is a, a good cycle, a healthy rhythm for your soul to be uh, growing in godliness. So with that, let's talk about the first uh, two verses here of Colossians. Let, let me reread them. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So three truths packed into this a short greeting. Number one, God is sovereign. He is in full control. We, we see this, first of all, in uh, the apostleship of Paul. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. If Paul isn't highlighting this, his apostleship, it seems, in this book, because there was a question about some people the false teachers were you know, trying to undermine his apostleship. This is just who he is. And he says, he, he doesn't have to say by the will of God, uh, but he does. And it's because God called him to be an apostle. This isn't something Paul was, was looking for. He wanted another degree, you know, another title to, you know, to put behind his name or anything like that. He was... He was out persecuting Christians, trying to kill Christians, trying to stop the advance of the gospel. And uh, Jesus came, found him, temporarily blinded him, turned him around, and Jesus is the one who made him an apostle. Um, well, what is an apostle? It's a representative charged with a commission, a, a sent out one. Uh, the verb of this word is used in Jesus' ministry as uh, God the Father sent out Jesus. And then Jesus sends out his 12 followers, also sends out uh, Paul. And uh, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is considered to be an apostle because not as traditional as the other uh, disciples who walked with Jesus and learned from him during his earthly ministry, but he uh, saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to him, taught him, and, and sent him out uh, for Paul was to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Again, this isn't a power play by Paul. This is God's doing, uh, not Paul's. And Paul is submitting to this call of God in his life. We also see uh, the sovereignty of God in uh, the sainthood of believers and of the brothers. In verse two, it says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. I, I, I chewed on this a little bit this week of, well, why does he say saints? He could have just said to the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. That, I mean, that would have worked. It, it's the same people. It's not like saints and faithful brothers are different uh, people. Uh, first of all, what does it mean to be a saint or holy one? At least in our world, when you hear people refer to it, uh, often they're thinking something like maybe Mother Teresa, you know, maybe Billy Graham. Maybe they'll go way back and you know pick a, a saint like Augustine or St. Paul, St. Peter, and maybe name a church after that or something like that. And when, when you boil it down to so. Why would you call this person a saint, but not, who, are, who are you choosing to be on your list of saints? It'd be something like, well, if this person isn't, you know, Billy Graham ain't in heaven, none of us are getting there, is what, what a lot of people would say. Or if this person seemed to, you know, be especially devout, devoted to um, the Christian faith, 
But the Bible has a different view of what saints are. And that is, it's not just a few uber spiritual, you know, upper echelon guys. It's all of us who are Christians here. And it's not, why is that? It's not because of us and what we have done. It's because what Jesus has done on our behalf. It's not based on our performance, but it's based on his performance for us. It, you know, why are the Colossian believers called holy? It's not because of, you know, what they had done. Otherwise, if they had already perfected the Christian walk, or that this letter would well probably be unnecessary, or at least sound a, a whole lot different. It's because of what Jesus did on their behalf that they have His righteousness given to them. And, you know, God doesn't just declare somebody to be a saint, declare you to be a saint. God changes you to be more like Jesus. And that's why Paul can rightfully say, say after this to the saints and faithful brothers as the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, changing them, making them faithful to him. So how does God's sovereignty God's control affect us. Well, just at a very basic level, and you can talk more about this in community groups this week, but uh, if you're a Christian here today, we need to be reminded it wasn't because of something I did, my performance, my work. It's because of Jesus's work, Jesus's performance. He is the one who's uh, made me a saint, not because of anything I have done. And that as we continue in the Christian life, it's Jesus who's changing me, making me more like him, that he isn't you know, wasting any time in taking me and taking you, making you into the person uh, he's called you to be. If you're not a Christian, well, God, God hasn't brought you here on accident today. He's, he's brought you here to hear the gospel and to believe and repent and uh, become a Christian. If, if you're struggling with that, just not sure, well, we'd love to talk with you after, talk with, you know, set up a time, go grab some coffee or something like that and uh, talk to you more about it. Second truth, as we continue of this uh, greeting, introduction to the letter, we see that believers are family in Jesus. That Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. So let me dispel a couple ideas might have, well, why does Paul refer to them as Timothy as a brother and to these uh, believers, this church, as brothers? Well, A, I know for sure it is not because Paul is Southern and just refers to everyone as as brother. That's not what's going on. Uh, Paul also, it's not because he's speaking some Christianese and has forgot their names you know, you got to love that one when someone like, are you calling me brother because you don't really remember my name? Or sister, if you're, uh, I mean, that, that, that's not what's going on here, is that Paul actually believes they are gospel family, that they, because they are in Christ, they are closer than biological family. It's gospel family. What unites this family? We'll look at verse 2 again. To the saints and faithful brothers, literally in Christ, in Colossae. I, I love that parallelism there. It's, it's beautiful. That the point Paul is, is making is that though they reside in Colossae, more importantly, they reside in Christ. 
that they are incorporated in Christ, that Jesus shapes their identity. They're inseparably joined with Christ in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, that they are joined as this this new family that Jesus has created, this gospel family that um, erases the cultural dividing lines of the day. In in their context, there there was a major Jew-Gentile distinction and you know, Paul declares them to be co-heirs of Christ together because they are all joined together in one family closer than biological family. You know, for us as Trinity Church, uh, the gospel breaks down the barriers of ethnicity, background, socioeconomic status that the church and Trinity Church is for all Christians. It's for rich or poor, black or white, powerful or vulnerable, for citizen or immigrant. We are here as gospel family. We're not here to proclaim that Jesus is Lord of one particular type of people that look a lot like us, act a lot like us, dress like us. We're here to proclaim that Jesus is Lord over people of every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That he deserves that worship. Uh, And one day every knee will bow. One day every tongue will confess his lordship, his kingship. And, And I would challenge you this week to start thinking about the church as gospel family, not as a place we go to and do our thing Sunday morning for an hour and a half or whatever amount of time it takes. We exit those doors just to either go to a community group or just come back on next Sunday morning. Think about it as gospel family. That's who we are, who we're called to be united in Christ because of our union with him. And uh, it's gospel family all week. Third point. And why are we gospel family in Jesus? Look at the end of verse two. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We're gospel family because Jesus brings abundant grace and true peace. So peace was the customary greeting um, in the Hebrew world. Uh, Grace is very prominent in the Christian message. And Paul's greeting here is not to be taken, though he gives similar greetings in other letters, is not to be taken kind of like the question, how are you? that someone might ask. And you got, you got to love, especially when somebody asks it and they don't even wait for you to respond. And have you ever thought like, I could have responded, I could have said dead. And they would have said, still said good or just walked by or, you know, you could have said all, they're just looking for good, you know, bye, hi. Uh, that, that's not what's going on here. This is grounded in gospel reality grounded in Jesus's perfect life, his substitutionary death, that we don't deserve God's favor. There's nothing in us. There's nothing we have done. It is freely given to us in Jesus. Jesus graciously gives us all the riches of God and brings us into that right relationship with him. He satisfies the wrath of God on our behalf Yes, it's free to us, freely offered, but it cost him dearly, cost him his very life. And and the peace that he brings is far more than just a greeting, far, far, far more than the world's message of world peace or peaceful relationships. 
This is peace rooted in what Jesus has done on our behalf, that he brings us peace by satisfying uh, God's wrath. He has inaugurated eschatological or end of the world peace. This is lasting peace that we can look forward to, that we can hope in, not just in a, oh, I hope it comes, but we know it is coming, that one day everyone will acknowledge Jesus' rule. This, this is very good news for us and news for us to proclaim to our unsaved relatives, coworkers, uh, neighbors. You know, we look forward to that day when all this unrest in the world will end and Jesus is recognized as the, the king he truly is. And that peace, that grace changes us and brings us into right relationship with each other. And first of all, that means us as a church and branching out from there to other people in our lives because of this peace Jesus has given us. That grace and peace is grounded in what Jesus has done on our behalf, and that uh, perfectly leads us to communion here, that we, we celebrate Jesus' body given for us, his blood poured out on our behalf. We break one loaf of bread because we are united as gospel family, united in him. Let me read... Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17 says that the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many, that's us, are one body. That's us too there. For we all partake of the one bread. Communion isn't for perfect people. It's for forgiven people who Jesus has called saints because of what he has accomplished. Let, let's read uh, 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to read this responsively together. If you wouldn't mind, read the underlined uh, sections with me. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So if you are a baptized believer in Jesus, communion is for you. you tear off a piece of the bread, uh, dip it in the wine. It, if you are not a Christian, don't take communion. You, you heard what this passage said. Uh, take Christ repent, believe the gospel, be united to him. Will we proclaim that through baptism? That I'm a follower of Jesus and it's not just me and Jesus. It's us as gospel family and Jesus. And we proclaim it publicly through baptism. We also at this time we give, not because we're paying for communion, not because... Um, not because we're just, the church requires some of our money. 
It's because we give in response to all that Jesus has so generously given to us. And our rightful response is giving back to him. And uh, we've got an offering box in the back. You can also uh, give online, as I know a lot of you guys uh, do. So let's, let's take some time here. Band, you can come. Let's uh, take some time to pray, to meditate. I'm going to uh, pray. And then as you continue praying, oh, as the Lord leads, if you're a Christian, go ahead to the back. And now let's uh, take communi- communion. And then let's sing. We, we, we sing not at the end of the sermon just because we need a little little break from the monologue. We sing because we're responding to what God has taught us. Where we sing because we're excited that Jesus really has conquered Satan's sin and death, that he is alive. And we proclaim that by singing together as a body of believers. So why don't I pray? Father God, we thank you that you have brought us into, those of us who are in Christ, brought us into right relationship with you through your grace, through your peace that you provide. We thank you that we are not looking to our own efforts, but we are looking to what Christ has done on our behalf. We thank you that we're gathered together as a church, as uh, the body of Christ, as a gospel family, that you've called us together, that you've broken down uh, the barriers of our world that would divide us. I I pray as we uh, take the bread, a drink uh, of of the cup, that we would meditate on what you have done on our behalf and that we would uh, celebrate it because you have given us hope. This world uh, can never have and never come up with apart from you. We pray this all because of what Jesus has done. Amen.